another episode of Quantum Crosstalk. I'm Olivia, and today we are going to be discussing the brand new Qiskit functions, which are in fact so new that even I don't know that much about them yet. So to help educate me and yourself, the user, the listener, I have brought in two of our best product managers on the IBM Quantum team, Sanket and Tushar, to tell us all about Qiskit functions and how they are going to change the direction for capabilities for our users and the landscape of quantum computing. Welcome, Sanket and Tushar. Thanks so much for coming down to the Kiskit studio. Could you, I guess, begin by just briefly introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about your job role at IBM? Awesome, yeah. Um, so my name is Tushar Mittal. Um, I lead our product management department at IBM Quantum. So a lot of my day-to-day -day is focused on, think, you know, prioritizing a lot of the features across our stack, mm -hmm. um, whether that be some like our flagship service, which is Qiskit Runtime, or thinking about the collection of tools that we add onto it to enable users. Mm -hmm. And so I have a team that uh, operates across those different um, pillars of our product uh, to deliver, hopefully, which is, is the best user experience possible. Great. And uh, hi, I'm Sankat. Uh, I'm one of the product managers on Tushar's team. Um, I lead Qiskit Function Service so and uh, Qiskit Serverless as well. Great. Well, that is appropriate for our conversation today, which is all about Qiskit functions. So I guess to get right into it, Sankit, what is Qiskit functions or what are Qiskit functions? Yeah, so Qiskit functions are a new set of services that we have that help developers you know, accelerate their work with abstractions. There's really two types of abstractions that we are introducing this time around, uh, circuit functions and application functions. So you can think of these functions as a way for developers who want to discover new algorithms and applications. You know, it can use a circuit function to abstract away transpilation, mitigation, suppression, and all these other types of hardware performance management. As well as, you know, we have these application functions which help uh, researchers from fields outside quantum bringing their expertise into, you know, quantum computing by mm -hmm. using a set of tools that do what circuit functions do, plus mapping their problems into, uh, you know, from, from classical state to a quantum circuits and opt, uh, observables. So I sort of get that, but it's still a little abstract. Could you give me like maybe one specific example of a function? Yeah, so we're rolling out the IBM circuit function. Um, in this function, uh, you have a whole suite of tools for error mitigation, suppression, transpilation, right? This should make it easier for end developers to be able to input their abstract circuits and observables, and at the end of it, get you know utility scale computation out of the box. This function is able to process your circuit and really determine what how much mitigation you might need okay. along the way. So I don't need to have already selected what types of error mitigation I want. The transpiler is going to recommend for me the types of error mitigation that it would want to implement. The circuit function will. So I think we have two separate experiences here. One is um, you know, what exists today, which is the transpiler by itself and then the primitives mm -hmm. that manage error mitigation. In that experience, you have the ability to tune exactly what you want. Yeah. Um, now, with the circuit function, what we want to do is we want to enable you to not have to worry about that. And so the circuit function is designed to make those best decisions for you, and it will continue to make those uh, as it, you know, as we develop it, it will continue to become more efficient at deciding for you in terms of what techniques need to be applied to give you a noise-free estimate. Okay, so the difference between the function and the sampler primitive as it stands now is when I use the sampler, I sort of have to guess and check what optimization and what error mitigation levels I need. It sounds like the function is going to remove that guessing and checking part for me. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely one point of it. And the other point with the sampler specifically is that the sampler, uh, you know, we've gone through some evolutions with the sampler as well. So the first sampler, you know, tried to execute all things that were like transpilation, as well as error mitigation and execution, all within the runtime environment. Mm -hmm. What we've learned with our recent kind of research on transpilation and improving our transpiler, um, and even, dis you know, discovering new passes that are powered by AI, is that we actually need to separate out these two uh, tools to maximize the performance we can get uh, in our end to end pipeline. So what you've seen over the course of this year is that we have evolved this an original sampler into a new version that is really focused on optimizing your execution or the step three of a Qiskit pattern. Mm. Um, and what we've done is we've defined an input and output format 
um, with both the transpiler side as well as um, the sampler, where the transpiler's job is to actually, it can live now you know, solely outside of um, the Qiskit runtime environment, and it can actually leverage any kind of elastic classical compute that it might need to, to give you, generate the most efficient instruction set architecture um, for your circuit. So or we call this the ISA circuit. Okay. Um, such that the sampler does what it does best, which is max, um, you know, provide the most efficient execution of that circuit mm -hmm. on the target hardware. Got it, cool. How is that different, what you're describing with error mitigation and needing to like pull different pieces and knowing how they fit together? How is that different than me just using the sampler primitive and saying, you know, optimization level equal three? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in those cases, right, you have an understanding of what options you're selecting, mm -hmm. whether that is what optimization level, what resilience level, or even tweaking inside your resilience level, uh, your resilience settings, you know, amplifier settings, so on and so forth. Each of those requires some amount of expertise in how um, transpilation happens, how error mitigation happens, and how to apply those sensibly to your workload. What we're doing with these circuit functions, on the other hand, is taking a look at you know, what are reasonable decisions uh, to go for an error mitigation suppression pipeline for your workflow. Okay. Another thing that I would throw in there is with the functions architecture. So one part of this is providing these prepackaged workflows as services, but the other part is kind of bringing together elastic classical compute mm -hmm. with quantum compute. So one of the things that we've learned as we've built modular tools so one of the you know one of the evolutions you've seen with even the sampler is the sampler has a second version as of uh, early this year we rolled out v2 of sampler which is focused on intaking isa circuits one of the reasons for that is we've learned that transpilation as a, as a process as a sub process there are strategies that actually require uh, um, elastic compute or a large amount of kind of compute that can be leveraged to deliver a better outcome and so decoupling the execution engine, which is the sampler, from the preparation engine, which is the transpiler, uh, and deploying that in two different compute environments actually has advantages. And so the, while functions are these prepackaged workflows, we're using, we're evolving kind of the quantum serverless framework to bring together these technologies where I can still get that similar experience that I used to have maybe with the sampler, but I can now leverage multiple capabilities at a, a level that I wasn't originally able to okay. in this heterogeneous architecture. Got it. So I guess my next question is, who is developing the functions? Who is making them? Yeah, so there's a couple of people working on this. So we have a function provided by IBM out of the box, the circuit function I mentioned before. Plus, we're you know leveraging our ecosystem, a collection of commercial startups, to really show what different types of circuit functions and application functions um, that they're you know starting to release. Cool. Mm -hmm. And. How, uh, how do you see the functions, both the ones being created from IBM and our ecosystem partners, how do you see them being like interwoven into a typical workflow? Um, in some ways they are prepackaged workflows, but I'll give you two examples. I think one, with the circuit function, um, we have a collection of researchers who are focused on translating effectively some domain-specific interpretation of their problem mm -hmm. to a circuit representation. And so a circuit function is a great tool for them because now they can spend more of their time translating and kind of developing mapping methods of their classical problems to their, let's say, quantum inputs. Yeah. And they can invoke the circuit function almost as a plug and play to handle all of the performance management uh, down below. Another way to look at this, which is at really at the foundation of all of this, is last year we introduced this concept of Qiskit patterns which is four canonical kind of category of steps that play out in the anatomy of an algorithm. Right, the first one being mapping. Correct. Like you said. And the second one uh, is a optimization down to the target circuit. Third one is execution and fourth is post-processing. And so if those other three steps or even the middle two, let's say optimizing my circuit and then running it efficiently with some mitigated outputs is, is, is done for me, I can actually plug in my own mapping tools and even my own post-processing tools at the end of this pipeline to build and design a new algorithm, for mm -hmm. example. So that's one example. Um, another, uh, another example is with a collection of application functions. Um, what you actually have is, for example, you know, we have a partner that is rolling out um, a graph solver. So what you can start to, uh, start to um, explore is what are the types of graphs 
that I actually can solve with the quantum computer and with these capabilities and start to narrow in on the types of problems I might want to integrate this function in for. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that we expect all, you know, our enterprise clients or just developers in those kind of more industry regimes to do is take an application function as like a prototype and they try to integrate that into maybe a larger workflow where there are certain key elements of um, maybe computation that they direct to the function versus maybe run classically. Okay. So these are a couple of ways we are looking to see how users interact with these functions and what they find useful. Got it. Got it. So my next question, but you already sort of answered this, is how is this going to help or change the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. But it sounds like it's another level of extraction. So if I understand it correctly, it's letting the users who have hopefully specific domain expertise really focus in on what they're good at and not need to focus in so much on the optimization of the quantum circuit. Is that right? 100%. Um, cool. So we have three personas that we feel like we have to tackle as a part of making quantum computing useful. There's the physicist persona that we have spent a lot of time working with, and that's yeah. really what a lot of the focus with the Cascade SDK and really delivering power tools is. The next set of personas, so I, I like to say this persona, this physicist persona, is focused on research um, for quantum computing, mm -hmm. where they're, you know, what what brings value to their research is they're making a quantum computer better, they're teaching a quantum computer how to be better at being a quantum computer, Yeah. right? The other two personas that we have on our roadmap, which is the quantum computational scientist, as well as the data scientist persona, which kind of ma marries up to a lot of the enterprise use cases, these researchers are looking to explore research with quantum computing, where mm -hmm. they wanted to do a task. Right. And if we can package up tools and give them kind of prepackaged components of their workflow, they can really focus on how to use it, uh, use a quantum computer with the collection of tools they already have, as opposed to having to build a custom pipeline every time. Got it. And so that's those are the users we're trying to engage as a part of this to bring kind of new tools into the market. Okay. So if I'm a I'm a physicist, which I guess I am technically, <laughs> and I'm looking to explore, like you said, quantum computing for better quantum computing. I might not want to use a function because I might be developing my own like mm -hmm. error mitigation techniques and new types of suppression that maybe don't exist as a function yet. However, when we publish papers and we get good results, we could turn those into functions so that computational scientists and data scientists could use them in their workflow seamlessly. Am I getting it? 1,000%. Cool. Um, I think uh, another thing, one example of like what are the tools that are emerging for um, uh, comp uh, for a physicist is that we are while we are building these abstracted functions what we're also building is a collection of Qiskit add-ons mm -hmm. and these are basically modular research capabilities that are translated into software tools that start to power basically if you think about each step in the pattern as a bucket we're dropping new Legos into the buckets for people to build new workflows or experiment with different types of circuits that they can unlock Okay. For, uh, that can be run on a quantum computer. Okay, so so if the, a function is, I don't know, a castle that I built out of a Lego, mm -hmm. then yes. an add-on is like a little piece of that? It's like another Lego. Like a turret on the castle? <laughs> um, yeah, it could be like a different shape uh, Lego that allows you to maybe like expand your castle in Got a way it. you couldn't before. Okay, cool. Right? It's starting to come together. I'm glad we went with the Lego metaphor. <laughs> All right, so if I'm a user and mm -hmm. I'm hearing about Qiskit functions for the first time, what should I do to upskill myself and to know how to use them? Um, I think a lot of this kind of starts with um, understanding, I think a, a one of the key focuses that we have is in our documentation, we're gonna highlight the types of workloads that these functions work well for. So what, for example, a lot of the circuit functions, um, one thing that would be helpful for users to start doing is understanding what a hardware efficient circuit is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the error mitigation and error suppression methods, they work really well with hardware efficient circuits. And so exploring the category of hardware efficient circuits and maybe say each application area is a place to get started in terms of how you might use a circuit function as a part of your work that you're doing. Okay. Um, in, in terms of application functions, um, you know, they're gonna be, we, we expect those to be more plug and play. So um, in this scenario, you're not necessarily thinking about working with circuits, but you're thinking about designing problems, maybe in the context of a domain, describing like the electronic structure of a problem or you know, mapping out a graph that might be optimal for these. So I think one of the key kind of things that I would say is um, try different problems and start to consolidate down to like what works, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 
And I can also add that there's going to be um, a bunch of tutorials that we're going to put on the learning platform specifically mm -hmm. for functions yet. 100%. So yep. you can always look there if you're not sure how to use a function or if you're not, if you want to see an example of it, we'll put those there. Mm -hmm. um, so how does this change the way that somebody should upskill themselves and the journey that somebody should take with their education in order to become proficient in quantum computing? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so right now, this entire quantum software stack is in deep research, right? Things like error mitigation, suppression, is still heavy research topics that will evolve over the coming years. That being said, though, I think that these functions, the circuit function and application functions, unlock new types of users to get started quickly and bring their expertise. What I mean by that specifically, right, is for circuit functions, an end user can focus on learning about what is a hardware efficient mapping. That's that representation shift from a classical data to quantum data is the main thing that they can focus on. Things like hardware performance and all that stuff, transpilation is something they can leave to the circuit function to solve for them. Mm. On the other hand, for application functions, I think that, you know, one one of the things that we're looking forward to seeing is people who are you know, have expertise outside of quantum. Learning how to use a quantum computer inside their workflow, bringing different types of problems to us and really both, yes, learning how they can map quantum into their workflow as well as how can quantum improve over time is gonna be a, an element that we've, you know, both learned on this journey. Cool. Yeah, I think a big part of that is just we're accelerating someone's ability to learn on uh, what they can do with a quantum computer. Yeah. Um, and so if we can give you managed experiences around how a computer, uh, how the quantum computer is optimized for your execution, and that's just a function that I call, I can spend more time learning and experimenting um, with the different use cases. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the key goal. And we expect to, you know, both from an IBM perspective as well as from our partner's perspective, we'll keep iterating on these functions to add more performance and make them more, uh, more and more general purpose. Over, uh, over the coming years. Okay, so I think what I've really gleaned from this conversation, the way I would summarize it, is the functions allow research scientists and users to keep being good at what they're good at yeah. and leave the details of the actual circuit optimization to IBM. Like, exactly. We got this part and you just focus on what you're good at. IBM and its partners. Yep. Um, I think there's gonna be one of the biggest ways that um, we're going to be able to catalyze this journey for our users is by partnering with our commercial ecosystem and a lot of the interesting work that's happening within our startups to maximize the tools that we can provide into our, into our users' hands as fast as possible. Cool. All right. Well, I think that I get it now. Uh, I hope that everybody understands it now, too. Thank you guys again so much for coming down to the studio and for chatting with me and teaching me what a Qiskit function is. I know you've been working on this for a really long time, and it's great to see this finally coming to the light. Yeah, we're very excited, and thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Sanket and Tushar, for coming into the studio and teaching me all about Qiskit functions. It is pretty rare that I go into one of these conversations not already being familiar with the software that we're talking about, but I genuinely did not know that much about Qiskit functions before this conversation today. And it truly did help clarify in my mind how we can use these functions to abstract away different details that the user might not need to really be experimenting with in order to complete their quantum algorithms. I think this really has a lot of potential to change the way that people are doing quantum computing. And so I think this is going to be really, really influential and tremendous. And I just want to thank, thank you guys again for coming down talking to me about it. And I hope you guys, as the user, take advantage of all of the documentation that we're providing in the description below. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.